So, I think this was, uh, so we will continue today working on the problem of uh, incorporating the effect of viscous heating in a viscometer, okay. And uh, one of the things we are going to see is that the estimation of the viscosity, if you neglect viscous heating, what is it going to be? And when you include the effect of viscous heating, how is it going to be affected? So that is the whole idea because viscosity is a function of temperature, okay. Now in the last class what we did was we worked on the problem of uh, the uh, momentum equation and we simplified it. So today we are going to take the energy equation which we had derived last time and we are going to simplify this again and do a perturbation series analysis, right. So we had assumed the viscosity to be varying as 1 divided by 1 plus alpha theta and k as varying linearly with theta, okay. Now this is perfectly fine, this has been done just to keep uh, the algebra simple in some sense. But uh, you know 1 by 1 plus alpha theta is, can also be approximated as a linear relationship if you are in, uh, interested in a, a small uh, interval of theta for example, okay. So, what we will do is we will uh, proceed with uh, simplifying the equation given as dk by dy multiplied by d theta by dy plus k times d square theta by dy square plus mu times du by dy the whole square equals 0. Okay. Now, I am going to uh, find dk by dy as, k is a function of theta and theta is a function of y. So, dk, the, the first term dk by dy becomes dk by d theta multiplied by d theta by dy times d theta by dy. So, this is just d theta by dy the whole squared plus k times d squared theta by dy squared plus um, mu times du by dy the whole squared equal 0. Now, I think there was some confusion the last time because I had not taken into account the 0th order term. But uh, I am just going to say that we seek theta as being equal to theta 0 plus Brinkman number times theta 1 plus higher order terms theta 2, u as u 0 plus Brinkman number times u 1 plus Brinkman number squared times u 2 plus higher order terms. These are the corrections which we need to find out. Now, basically what this means is when the Brinkman number is 0 and that is the small parameter about which I am doing the expansion, I am going to have to, the solution to the governing ma ma the momentum and the energy equation is going to be theta 0 and u 0, okay. Physically what is it? When there is no viscous heating, the temperature is going to be isothermal, temperature is going to be equal to T naught everywhere or theta is going to be 0, okay. And the velocity profile is going to be linear and when we, since we made it dimensionless, we know that theta 0 is 0 and u 0 is y. Let us just say from uh, the condition that Brinkman number is 0. Well, if Brinkman number is 0, then basically uh, there is no viscous heating. The momentum equation, there is no temperature change, momentum equation, temperature equation become decoupled and you can solve separately, okay. And physically that is what you expect, no temperature change, linear velocity profile. I am going to substitute 
all the things that I know dK by d theta is nothing but beta okay. So, I am going to write this as beta multiplied by d theta by dy whole squared d theta by dy whole squared is nothing but d by dy of theta 0 plus Brinkman number times theta 1 plus etc whole squared plus k which is nothing but 1 plus beta theta times d square theta by dy squared of theta plus uh, mu is 1 divided by 1 plus alpha theta times du by dy the whole squared equals 0. I am just doing this possibly in a slightly inefficient way, but then uh, I hope to minimize mistakes that I may end up making. So, this is beta and uh, now what I need to do is substitute for theta in terms of this expansion because my job is to find out theta 0, theta 1, theta 2 and if I find out this then I can substitute it back here and find out what theta is, right. So, I know theta 0 is 0 and uh, what does this give me d by dy of I am just inserting this so then it simplifies my life otherwise I just if I put, do not put theta 0 equal to 0 here I will get a 0th order term and then I have to calculate it I am just using the fact that I have already calculated the 0th order term. So I am just going to use that to directly get the first order term okay and you can clearly see that this term is not going to be first order because the lowest power that this is going to contribute to is the Brinkman number squared. So, this is actually going to give me a second order term. So, for the first order thing this is basically 0 okay this is not a first order term. Let us come to this term here 1 plus beta and theta is written as theta 0 which is 0 uh, plus theta 1 multiplied by Brinkman number plus higher order terms which I do not want to write because that is going to give me Brinkman number squared okay and d square theta by dy square is going to be when I substitute this back inside here I am going to get theta 0 0 I get Brinkman number times d square theta 1 by dy square okay plus higher order terms which we do not worry about and uh, this term here represents what? plus one plus alpha theta inverse times du by dy squared okay du by dy squared is going to be du 0 by dy which is 1 plus Brinkman number times du 1 by dy that is when I substitute this back inside here du 0 by dy is 1 plus Brinkman number times that plus higher order terms whole squared equals 0. Okay. So, I am telling you here that this term is of order Brinkman number squared, this term because the leading order term will be Brinkman number squared. So, I, this is going to drop off, okay. So, I do not worry about this. What about this term here? This term here gives me A 1 multiplied by this will give me a term of order Brinkman number. This multiplied by this is going to give me a term of order Brinkman number squared, okay. So, to order Brinkman number what I have is, uh, so the second term on the left hand side at order of Brinkman number is equal to 1 multiplied by 
d squared theta 1 by d y squared ok. Because the this term is of order B, uh, Brinkman number squared because Brinkman number multiplied by Brinkman number. And uh, what about the term on the right hand side? This I am going to do a binomial series expansion. Uh, oh, it is not on the right hand side, it is also on the left hand side. So, the, the second, the third term, third term on the LHS, yeah, the third term on the LHS is by doing a binomial series expansion like at 1 minus alpha theta, okay, etcetera, multiplied by 1 plus Brinkman number times du1 by dy the whole squared, the whole thing squared, right, the whole thing squared. And uh, now you substitute this thing back inside, this is equal to theta is theta 0 plus Brinkman number times theta 1, 1 times theta 1 plus higher order terms square ok. So, the point is yeah what is the point here? This term here gives me this term here gives me 1 plus I I keep making this mistake here right this is Brinkman number times theta 1 plus the higher order terms which I neglect and this gives me the du by dy which is 1 plus Brinkman number this whole square yeah let us keep going. So, I get uh, 1 minus alpha Brinkman number times theta 1 times 1 plus 2 times br times du 1 by dy the whole squared plus ok. So, what am I left with? I have actually got a problem. So, you think I have made a mistake here? Because this should simplify to 1 times Brinkman number. So, th these guys will not contribute only this I have to worry about ok let us go ahead I get 1 multiplied by 1 plus 2 times du 1 by dy times Brinkman number ok and uh, minus alpha times Brinkman number times theta 1. So, clearly uh, things are not as good as uh, they should have been because I have made a mistake somewhere here. Yeah, I should have taken the uh, yeah the simplification in the al algebra uh, I could have taken this in the denominator I would have got 1 plus alpha theta here I would have got 1 plus alpha theta here and then things are fine. So, what is this 1 plus alpha theta? Yeah, so that is uh, why do you think I made a mistake? Because this should actually simplify to 1 or this should simplify to Brinkman number and then I have the second term uh, should be at order Brinkman number this should give me 1 ok. 
Now clearly I am not getting 1 here and uh, I am unable to find my mistake. Let us do it like this, yeah. Anyways, right? It is unbalanced. This is an order 0, yeah, yeah, the order 0 term is not a problem because I am not taking that into account, but this is the, let us do like this. I am going to redo this uh, thing, yeah. No problem. So, we come back to this equation and uh, we start here, okay. 1 plus beta multiplied by and I am going to take this 1 plus alpha theta to the other side. Yeah, we should get this thing, do not worry, we will we'll figure this out, hopefully soon. Right. So, all I am doing is taking the 1 plus alpha theta 1 reciprocal here, I am neglecting that because that is going to contribute everything of order beta br squared, okay. And uh, let us see if this helps. If it does not help, then uh, we really do have a problem. Plus, Okay, so now we come back to this one and say this is 1 plus alpha theta 1 multiplied by br and this is 1 plus beta times theta 1 br plus br d square theta 1 by dy squared. So, this there is already a Brinkman number here and the only term which will be of order Brinkman number which contributes to this is going to be when I take the 1 and 1 here because everything else is going to give me a higher order term, okay. So that definitely makes my life simple. Then uh, all right. I do not seem to have uh, solved my problem because I really have not found my mistake, right. So, this guy here gives me d square theta 1 by dy squared and uh, if you do it right, what you should get is plus 1 here, okay. And so, you guys have to do it right and get plus 1 and so now we move on. Assuming it is in it plus 1 equals 0. Let us not uh, spend time on this. The point is d square theta 1 by dy squared plus 1 equals 0, okay. If you uh, uh, do it right. And uh, so now what I can do is I can solve this for theta 1 and uh, that gives me d square theta 1 by dy squared equals minus 1. And you can integrate this out, you get d theta 1 by dy equals minus y plus c1, okay. Theta 1 is again integrate it out one more time, you get minus y square by 2 plus c1y plus c2. Okay. The boundary conditions on theta are the theta has to be 0 at the two walls. Okay. So, every term in my perturbation expansion has to satisfy this. So, the boundary conditions are theta 1 equals 0 at y equals 0 and 1. Okay. I use that at y equal to 0, I should get theta 1 is 0, so I get C2 equals 0. Okay, and I get uh, 
half equals C1. So this implies that theta 1 is So this implies theta 1 is half of y minus y squared. That's theta 1. Now you go back to the equation which we had derived yesterday, which actually related u1 to theta 1. Okay, and you can actually solve this equation for um, u1. Yesterday, from the momentum balance to the first order, we derived an equation which said something like. Uh, d squared u1 by dy squared and you have to tell me what we got. We got this equals alpha times d theta 1 by dy, is it? Can you check? Is it plus or minus? This is plus, okay. So now I have already found out what theta 1 is, okay. I can substitute this here and I can solve this equation for u1. So this way I am getting my correction for u1 for the velocity and the first order. So substituting the theta1 which I have got here and that is what we want to do, remember solve a bunch of equations sequentially is alpha multiplied by d theta1 by dy which is half minus 2y by 2 which is y. Okay. So again you can do the same thing, integrate this out and find u1. So d, the point is d squared theta 1 by dy squared plus 1 equals 0. Okay. If you uh, uh, do it right and uh, so now what I can do is I can solve this for theta 1. And uh, that gives me d squared theta 1 by dy squared equals minus 1. And you can integrate this out, you get d theta 1 by dy equals minus y plus c1, okay. Theta 1 is again integrate it out one more time, you get minus y squared by 2 plus c1y plus c2, okay. The boundary conditions on theta are that theta has to be 0 at the 2 walls, okay. So every term in my perturbation expansion has to satisfy this. So the boundary conditions are theta 1 equals 0 at y equals 0 and 1, okay. I use that at y equal to 0, I should get theta 1 is 0, so I get C2 equals 0, okay. And I get uh, half equals C1. So this implies that theta 1 is, so this implies theta 1 is half of y minus y squared. That is theta 1. Now you go back to the equation which we had derived yesterday, which actually related u1 to theta 1. Okay, and you can actually solve this equation for um, u1. Yesterday, from the momentum balance to the first order, we derived an equation which said something like uh, d squared u1 by dy squared. And you have to tell me what we got. We got this equals alpha times d theta1 by dy, is it? Can you check? Is it plus or minus? This is plus, okay. So now I have already found out what theta 1 is, okay. I can substitute this here and I can solve this equation for u1. So this way I am getting my correction for u1 for the velocity and the first order. So substituting the theta 1 which I have got here and that is what we want to do, remember, solve a bunch of equations sequentially is alpha multiplied by d theta 1 by dy which is half minus 
2 y by 2 which is y. Okay. So, again you can do the same thing integrate this out and find u 1. So, d u 1 by d y equals alpha times y by 2 minus y squared by 2 plus a constant c 1 and you can integrate this one more time to get u 1 equals alpha multiplied by integrate this one more time y squared by 4 minus y cube by 6 plus c 1 y plus c 2. Okay. So, I think the chances of me making mistakes here is very minimal, but you never know. The point I want to make here now is using the boundary conditions, what are the boundary conditions at y equals 0 and 1, u 1 is 0, the no slip boundary conditions. Okay. So, this implies what? C 2 is 0 okay. and so what is C 1? 0 equals alpha multiplied by 1 by 4 minus 1 by 6 plus C 1 which gives me C 1 is alpha times 1 by 6 minus 1 by 4 which is alpha times minus alpha by 12. Okay. So, I have got u 1 as alpha times y squared by 4 minus y cube by 6. minus y by 12. Okay. So, this is my first order correction to the velocity profile u 1 and uh, you already know the temperature equation. So, basically what I am trying to tell you here is when you have viscous heating, there is going to be a modification in the linear velocity profile without the viscous heating when the thing is isothermal your velocity profile is linear. If you have actually a temperature dependency heat generate uh, heat being generated viscosity being a function of temperature and let us say it does not uh, vary too much a small temperature rise and you will have a difference in the velocity profile that is being caused by the variation of the viscosity with temperature. Okay. The variation of the viscosity of the temperature makes the velocity deviate from the straight line. Okay. So, that is the idea. So, what is the deviation that you get? What is the actual velocity profile? So, the temperature, so what we have done is we have calculated the temperature first and we are substituting it and getting the velocity profile. So, the actual velocity is going to be u0 which is nothing but y plus Brinkman number times u1 and u 1 is what we have just calculated which is um, alpha multiplied by y squared by 4 minus y cube by 6. I should have written this in a slightly better way, but then uh, in increasing powers or something like that, but let it be as it is. So, that is the correction which I have to the velocity profile. So, remember if Brinkman number is 0. I get the Kuwait flow linear profile. If alpha is 0, which means my viscosity is constant, viscosity does not change with uh, temperature, then again there is no correction to the profile. So, the basically the modification in the velocity profile is occurring only because of uh, the Brinkman number or the alpha. If one of them is 0, you will have no change. Okay. So, you may ask, so what? Of course, if you are interested, you can go ahead and do higher order terms and get better corrections, right? Now, the question is this the objective of any viscometric study is we are trying to estimate the viscosity of the liquid, okay? And um, if you uh, remember, suppose we have an isothermal situation 
That means Brinkman number is 0. No temperature rise and how do you estimate uh, the viscosity? Mu is tau xy, the plane was x, right? So, tau xy, oh, was it yx? Yeah, tau yx, isn't it? This is, y is in this direction, tau yx at y equals 0 divided by the shear rate, the shear rate is du by dy and what you know is, you know the bottom plate is at velocity 0, upper plate is at velocity capital U and U divided by D because it is a linear uh, profile, you are going to assume that this is just U by D, okay. That is, this is the shear rate, so this is the stress at the wall and this is the uh, shear rate. Okay. So, this would be the actual viscosity which you are going to measure because viscosity is not changing. Now, supposing it is actually a non isothermal situation, what you are going to do is you are going to you can do two things. One is you can assume that there is still a linear velocity profile inside, that is, you just know what the velocity is at the bottom, you know what the velocity is at the top, and assuming that the variation is linear. Now, of course, that is wrong. But what you are going to get is something like an apparent viscosity, something like an effective viscosity, okay. So, basically what I am saying is, if we have a temperature rise, then the effective viscosity or the apparent viscosity is going to be given by tau y x at y equals 0 divided by u by d. Why is there an effective viscosity? Because I am assuming that the profile is linear, well, it is actually not linear. I am not correcting for the non-linear velocity profile here, okay. So, this is viscosity since we are not correcting for the deviation from the linear profile. Okay. So, in order for you to get the actual velocity, uh, actual viscosity, what would you have to do? You would have to find out the shear stress at the wall and you have to find the shear rate also at the wall. But to find the shear rate at the wall, you have to include the correction term as well, okay. So, when you actually use the entire velocity field and get the shear rate, then you uh, the viscosity that you are going to be calculating is the one which is the actual viscosity, not the effective viscosity, okay. So, the reason I am calling this apparent is because I have assumed it is still linear and that is wrong, okay, because actually it is varying. Um, so, what about the actual uh, shear rate, shear rate at y equal to 0, that is du by dy at y equal to 0, that is going to be 1 plus, sorry, uh, at y equal to 0, right, only this guy is going to contribute 1 minus alpha Brinkman number by 12, because I am evaluating this at y equal to 0, because that is what I want to uh, find the viscosity, right. So, now, the actual viscosity is going to be tau yx 
at y equals 0 divided by the actual shear rate. The shear rate, remember this is a dimensionless shear rate. I want to convert it to dimensional, which means I am going to multiply this by the characteristic velocity and the characteristic length. I get my u by d again, okay. It is u by d multiplied by 1 minus alpha br divided by 12. So, this is my actual viscosity that I have. I want to basically uh, relate the mu apparent to the actual mu, okay. And uh, what I am going to do is I am just going to eliminate the tau y x, the shear stress between these two equations and uh, I am going to find that mu, so from these two expressions. I find that mu apparent is going to be mu multiplied by 1 minus alpha Brinkman number by 12, okay. So that is the correction which you have to do. So, so if you do not want to worry about, say as an engineer, you do not want to worry about what the actual velocity profile is. You know my top plate velocity, you know my your bottom plate velocity. So what you would do is you would just use that to find the shear rate and the in instrument is going to give you your shear stress. You divide, you get the apparent viscosity. So once you know the apparent viscosity and if you know the properties of your fluid, you know your alpha and you know your Brinkman number, you can use this to get the actual viscosity. Okay, so this is a correction which you have to do. If your uh, vis uh, fluid has a viscosity, has a thermal conductivity which depends on temperature. So the point I am trying to make here is that this is the actual viscosity where the actual strain rate uh, at the lower wall at y equals 0 is used, okay. So that is the reason this is the actual viscosity which is there and if you do not want to take into account the correction and assume that the velocity profile is still linear, then you get the apparent viscosity. So that is the two different things that we are doing here. So this is the correction or this is the relationship between the two viscosities, okay. The apparent viscosity is calculated using the overall shear rate u by d. I do not remember what uh, dimension I used last time, but maybe it was d and mu is calculated using the actual shear rate du by dy at y equals 0. This is basically done in uh, Gary Leal and you can take a look at it, but only thing I realized uh, after the last class was I think I switched the alpha and the beta. So I have the alpha with the viscosity, he has alpha with the thermal conductivity. So some small adjustment you have to make possibly, okay. Okay, so what we have done is we have basically seen two problems where uh, we just illustrated the idea of doing this perturbation series uh, analysis, okay, where we can get analytical solutions for uh, nonlinear equations. The first one was this percentile flow problem and the second one was this uh, problem with the viscous heating. Now, um, the approach that we have been using is what is called a regular perturbation series is what we have illustrated so far. Okay. Now there is another uh, class of problems where this regular perturbation series will not work. So I am just going to tell you what the name is first and the other class is 
what is called a singular perturbation series. Is problems. So, to give you an idea, just uh, again to illustrate this idea in a very simple way, we will do what we always do we start with the polynomial, and the simplest polynomial is a quadratic, right and uh, everybody understands what a quadratic is. So, you only we started off with the quadratic to begin with if you remember and then we start came to a differential equation. So, now we go back to our quadratic again because that is my comfort zone right. So, consider this quadratic epsilon x squared plus x minus 1 equals 0. Okay. Clearly, because there is a quadratic, I need to have two roots. Okay. And uh, so, this has two roots since it is a quadratic. And uh, what you would do is you would say, oh, this is a small parameter epsilon. So, let us do a perturbation series and let us uh, get these roots, right. So, of course, you know what the roots, okay, let us get the roots, right. So, if we do a perturbation series, if we seek x like we did last time, x0 plus epsilon x1 plus etcetera, and now if you were to put epsilon equal to 0, because that is the solution to that is what gives you x0, okay. If we put epsilon equal to 0, then what do I get? To, to find x0, we have x equals 1 or, or we have only one root. So, the other root, the information is not even there. So, if you remember we need to have in the last earlier problem when we did we had two roots and then we got corrections to each of those roots, okay. But now what has happened the other root has disappeared, the other root has disappeared because this prob the parameter epsilon is now multiplying my leading order term. If my epsilon had been in one of the other order terms my x to the power 1 term or my constant term I could have proceeded, even then there are situations when the uh, perturbation series may not work, okay. So, the point is let us look at uh, why this problem is arising, okay. And uh, one way to do that is since I already know the solution to this equation because it is a quadratic you know the formula for the quadratic equation. So, let us use that and see what happens to the two roots, okay. So, the uh, exact solution is uh, minus b which is minus 1 plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2 epsilon, correct. And uh, we will do for small epsilons, we do our uh, famous binomial uh, series expansion and uh, what do we get for small epsilon? This is approximately minus 1 divided by 2 epsilon plus or minus 1 minus 2 epsilon plus etcetera, okay. You know 1 plus is this plus? You are right it is plus, yep it is plus. So, what do I get? What are my two roots? My two roots are? My two roots are uh, 2 epsilon by, by 2. So, x uh, the two roots are 1, 2 epsilon divided by 2 epsilon, 
and then I have minus and minus cancels, I have minus 1. Wow, something is wrong. Yeah, uh, minus 2, minus 2 epsilon divided by 2 epsilon, correct? And I take plus, I get 2 epsilon by 2 epsilon, yeah, wonderful. So this gives me 1 and minus 1 by epsilon minus 1. So in the limit of epsilon tending to 0, this root is going to go to infinity, okay? And that is what it means is normally what we are doing is we are assuming that the x is going to vary smoothly, small changes in x gives you small changes in, uh, small changes in epsilon gives you small changes in x, but what we see is this guy is pushing off to infinity as epsilon tends to 0. So, x is actually becoming unbounded. So, the usual way in which you can actually solve this problem and these kinds of problems usually arise when you have different scales in the problem, okay, when you have multiple uh, length scales or multiple time scales in the problem. So, wh what we have to do is we have to remember that there are multiple scales and in the limit of epsilon tending to 0, since x is actually tending to infinity, you actually go about defining a new variable and then you calculate, okay. So, this here as epsilon tends to 0, x tends to infinity, okay. So, we cannot do a perturbation about this other root is actually infinity, okay. So how do you overcome this problem? Uh, by exploiting the fact that this implies that we have some multiple scales and we define that as a new variable y. I want to make sure y does not push off to infinity. I want to make sure y is, you know, going to be bounded. x is going off to infinity. That means x is, you can see x is going as 1 by epsilon, okay. The lower the epsilon is, x is pushing off to infinity and is kind of inversely proportional to epsilon. So, I am going to define y as x multiplied by epsilon. So, as epsilon tends to 0, uh, x goes as 1 by epsilon and so this guy is going to be bounded finite in the limit of epsilon tending to 0. So, this is a new variable which I am defining, okay. And basically what I am doing is I am scaling which uh, if I, I actually had a physical problem that means I am defining my length scale in a different way to actually get a bounded solution in that region, okay. Now, of course, you are looking at this as a mathematical problem, but tomorrow when you are actually solving a physical problem, this would correspond to something like a length scale or a dimensionless number, right? which means like we saw earlier, your time scale can be different. Okay. So, now if you were to substitute this in your quadratic equation and uh, you will get a quadratic equation in y. So, let us do that. So, x is y by epsilon. So, now this gives me epsilon multiplied by y by epsilon whole squared plus y by epsilon minus 1 equal to 0. Okay. And uh, when I expand this out, I get this implies y squared plus y minus epsilon equal to 0. So, this of course has gotten rid of the epsilon for, from a second power, it is not the coefficient of my quadratic term, my uh, y squared term, it is now moved to my constant term. So, now I can uh, be bold enough to try and seek a perturbation series solution. Okay, and I can get y as an approximate solution. Once I get y, I can scale it back and get x. Okay, so this is one way in which you can uh, actually uh, solve problems, just singular perturbation problems. So, singular perturbation problems occur in many areas. For example, 
if you have a viscous flow in a channel or along a wall and you are used to boundary layer flows, right. In a boundary layer flow, what do you do? You assume that very close to the boundary layer, we have a small region where the effects of viscosity is important. Far away from the boundary layer, the effect of the viscosity is not important, right. Remember, in your Navier-Stokes equation, your viscous term occurs as a second order term, it is a differential equation now. So, that means far away when the viscous terms are not important, if you would actually drop the viscosity effect, your second order equation has now become a first order equation because you are you're dropping off all your uh, del square v terms, okay. So, effectively to solve the equation you had to have two boundary conditions, but now since it is the first order equation you need to satisfy only one boundary condition. So, the fact that you are unable to uh, satisfy both the boundary conditions tells you that you will not be able to satisfy the boundary condition near the wall where the viscous effects are important. So, what you have to do is just like we did here for low epsilon we did a rescaling. What you do in boundary layer theory is in near the boundary layer you rescale your variables to find the solution in the boundary layer. Then you find the solution away from the boundary layer and then you try to match. Okay. So, basically uh, boundary layer flows is another example where singular perturbations are important. So, I just wanted to mention this because the perturbation series method has some uh, maybe I should not call it limitations, it is not so simple and straightforward to apply all the time. It is not that every time you can seek uh, you know a perturbation series solution and uh, expect it to work. There are times when it will not work okay. and one example is this singular perturbation. So, I will just say that uh, when you do boundary layer flows, okay, we assume far from the wall the flow is inviscid. Near the wall, it is viscous. So, if you remember you have this boundary layer over a flat plate, you have u0 uniform. So, effectively there is no velocity gradient far away from the wall, but here it is varying parabolically or uh, in some shape eventually it matches with this. So, the point is here I would actually have to retain the effect of viscosity, here I have to retain the effect of viscosity and here I have a second order equation and here I have a first order equation and I, I will not worry about trying to satisfy the no slip boundary condition. This profile I will worry about satisfying the no slip boundary condition because this is my second order equation, I need to have two conditions, one is no slip here and u equal to u naught at the boundary layer. Here I am just going to not worry about satisfying this, so I can, it looks like I am allowing it to slip, okay. So, these are problems which are actually solved by the method of what is called matched asymptotic expansions. help us solve such problems, okay. And I am just giving you some uh, key words here for you to you know pick up and read, those of you who are interested how this uh, mass asymptotic expansion done. So, uh, once you get the idea, you can possibly apply it to some problem, okay. What we want to do tomorrow is uh, talk about what is called the domain perturbation method, okay. So far what we have done is we have always talked about the small parameter occurring in the differential equation and then we said how do we go about doing this perturbation series. We need to now worry about the situation when maybe the small parameter is occurring in the boundary condition and the boundary is not going to be uh, coinciding with one of your coordinates y equal to constant, z equal to constant 
and the boundary itself is actually having the small parameter. How do you go about solving that? We need this uh, method to be able to actually solve the stability problems we will be worrying about later.